even though you walk through the valley. The problem is many people have made their bed in the valley. Yes. <laughs> they're sleeping in the valley, eating in the valley, and that's their destiny and destination as far as they're concerned. They cannot see that it's actually a walk through. So there's another side. Someone say there's another side. And when you go through those difficult times, oftentimes God is using that, even though the enemy may allow this, uh, the enemy releases things against us, God uses it. What they, we sang earlier and actually, what the enemy meant for evil, God is what? Turning it around. I want to declare that 2020 is a year of the turnaround. It's a year where what the enemy meant for evil, the Lord is turning it around. Someone say, turn it around. Yeah, you may have been struggling with depression and lack and oppression, but we're declaring this year is a year of the turnaround. Yes, where what the enemy meant for evil, he's going to regret attacking you in that area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's going to regret it. It's amazing to me that the enemy had no idea that he wanted Jesus to be crucified on the cross, but he had no idea he was helping God fulfill his plan. He had no idea God was using his pride and ignorance and hatred. God was using that to accomplish his ultimate end, which is what we know as the mystery of the gospel. The devil had no idea what was going on. He was he even saw the prophecies in Isaiah. He knew them, but the prophecies were secret codes. So you couldn't understand it without a decoder. <laughs> Holy Spirit. And the devil doesn't have the, he could read the prophecy, but he had no idea because God had hidden his plan in those words. And so the devil helped Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit accomplish their purpose on the earth without knowing that he was actually doing what God wanted all along. In the same way, I believe 2020, God is going to turn things around that have seemed so horrible, so terrible. So like, Lord, why am I going through this? I believe God will turn it around for good, for the advancement of his kingdom. Does anyone believe that here today? It's a year of the turnaround. I'm declaring that right now. So we've been doing this ministry press on for a few years now, and God has been amazing, uh, just blessing us. I didn't plan to be in ministry, by the way. I don't have an ambition to preach. I know I meet people who become Christians, or maybe they've been Christian for a while, and they're just itching to preach. They're itching to step on a platform and declare the word of God. That's not me. I was never itching to be in ministry. I was brought up in ministry. I've been around parents who are in ministry. Nothing in me was itching to be on a platform. So I am really shocked I'm up here right now, because this was not my agenda. In fact, I say to God sometimes, Lord, you tricked me. How did you get me into leading a prayer ministry when I don't even enjoy prayer? From the beginning, I did not enjoy prayer and I don't know how I ended up doing this. The fact that I am now enjoying prayer tells me there's hope for you. <laughs> You're like, oh, I don't enjoy prayer. Oh, I find it boring. Well, I was like that. And yes, there's sometimes where it's intense in terms of the impact on the flesh and you feel like it's boring, but it's only because you have no eyes to see what's going on in the realm of the spirit. If you saw what was happening when you pray, even when you felt it was boring, you will never miss a prayer meeting in your life ever again because angels are moving. So I say, I'm not itching to preach because when I preach, I can move men and women, but when I pray, I can move angels and demons. I don't know about you. I'd rather be moving angels and demons and orchestrating atmospheres of heaven over regions than just having a nice time that looks good to the people on the earth while in heavenly realms I'm making no impact. I want to be famous in heaven and famous in hell. Some people are famous on the earth, but they're not known in heaven. I don't know about you. I'd rather be known in heaven because I'm walking with God in authenticity, not just looking good on the platform. So the Lord has really been doing this work in me, calling me to lead this ministry. And it's been amazing. This, uh, we're 10 years now, and God has been so good. It's called Prayer Storm. All that say, you can check out some resources we brought out of the back. You know, uh, 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 I brought a CD here that we released some time ago called We Declare War. And uh, it's got some tracks on there that are prayer, a couple tracks that are prayer, declarations, one about the UK, and one about just personal prayer. And we've heard some incredible testimonies and some amazing songs on there as well. Actually, when we released this, we're all surprised because it went to number one on the iTunes chart wow. in the Christian category, by the way, just to say. <laughs> but we're so amazed because God really just releases favor and it's seen so many people uh, just impacted by what's on this. And there's other resources, teaching materials and things like that. Do check that out at the back. So, prayer storm has been something that the Lord put on our hearts because he wants to stir up a move of prayer in the church. And I love that as a church, you're in a season of prayer and fasting because every great move of God is preceded by a great move of prayer. 
Your prayer life is like the index to see how spiritually hungry you are and where your walk is with God. When you're hungry for God, it's manifested in the way you seek him. You cannot tell me you're hungry for God and have a non-existent prayer life. Your prayer life, it's, it's where we see how desperate you are for God. And it's been said, you go to church on a Sunday morning, you find out how popular the church is. Sunday evening, you find out how popular the pastor is. Prayer meeting day, how popular God is. Question, E5 Church, how popular is God here? <laughs> I hope he's popular, not just in January when you're fasting, but all through the year. Not just the fight of, oh, the pastor said we should fast and pray, so we're going to see God now. And then for the rest of the year, you kind of like just go away doing your own thing. I believe God is wanting the church to be a house of prayer. And can I just say this and make this loud and clear? The ministry of prayer and intercession is not for some special people. There's no such thing in the Bible as the gift of intercession. If you've seen it, come and tell me so that I can update my teaching. But so far, I have never seen anywhere in the Bible where prayer is one of the, uh, one of the offices in the uh, ministry of the, of, of the saints in the New Testament. I don't see that. Or um, one of the uh, gifts of the Spirit. There's no such thing as the gift of intercession. Now, I do believe there is a grace. This Bible talks about the, grace, the spirit of grace and supplication. Because if it's a gift, then you're going to say, well, James, you have the gift and I don't. So, James, I'm going to outsource my prayer life to you. And I'll send you all my prayer requests and you do all my prayer. Isn't that what a lot of people do? Oh, the lady at the back of the church, she loves to pray. I'm just going to send all my prayer requests. No, no, no. You cannot outsource your prayer life. You see the people leading us in worship a few moments ago, just like they lead us in worship, you don't watch them on the stage and go, they're called to do, they're not, called, they're not on the stage doing your worship for you. They're leading you and together... They're worshiping, and you should be worshiping. They're not there to replace your worship. So they're worship leaders. In the same way, they are prayer leaders who may seem like they have a gift of prayer, but it's actually a gift in leadership in an area, and they're, to, they're there to inspire you to do your own praying. So don't just send them your prayer request and then watch Netflix all day. Prophets of the nature of John the Baptist are forged in the deserts of fasting, not the deserts of feasting. So as you step into this season, you've got to realize God is wanting to forge something in the spirit realm in your life that's beyond what you've seen before. That's why you need to separate yourself in seeking God in fasting. Fasting and prayer is not a way of twisting God's arm to do what he doesn't want to do. Actually, it's not about changing God. It's about changing you. You're the one that needs to change. Someone say, I need to change. Because you cannot change yourself, and I cannot change myself, you position yourself for him to come and do some deep things in you. And that is one of the things that fasting does. You quieten the desires of the flesh so that the desires of the spirit can be louder. See, you feed your body so much more than you feed your spirit. You feed your body lots of meals a day. You watch TV. You have all your fun, social gatherings. And so it's all body, flesh, inspired and motivating. That's all that happens there. But you feed your spirit a Sunday service and then maybe a midweek service. So you feed your spirit like two maybe cold snacks a week. And you feed your body five meals a day. So when the body ends up with a fight in the, with the spirit, when they both end up in a fight, temptation, you know who's going to win? The one you've been feeding the most. Because what you feed grows and what you starve dies. That's why fasting starves the flesh to feed the spirit so that you become stronger and your spirit man, your spirit, the spirit within begins to rule your life. You're struggling with addictions and sins and all these things because the flesh is actually overpowering the spirit. And when you step into seasons like this, it's important that you begin to engage with God and allow him to do that deep work in you. It's dangerous to enter new seasons, come out of one season, enter another season in the flesh. It's very dangerous. And that's why many churches across the world would set out time in January time because it's a kind of significant of a new season. You want to start in a place of connectedness with God's agenda. You don't want to just go on with, oh yeah, you just carry on from 2019, 2020 without really getting with God and having some evaluation. Lord, pray prayers like, Lord, what is your evaluation of my life? Because it, it's probably going to be a lot different to what you think. Sometimes shocking in the negative in terms of things that need to change. And sometimes it might even be encouraging that you, things you've never seen before. But I often like to say, Lord, shock me now. Don't shock me on the day of judgment when it's too late and all of a sudden I realized I wasted my life 
on movies, TV, and doing all, all sorts of things that were seemingly okay, but they actually caused me to miss your ultimate purpose for my life. I don't want to be shocked then. Someone say, God, shock me now. Yeah, yeah, and you better mean it because he's going to shock you <laughs> and show you what you're doing that's out of order. He's after his purpose being manifested. As we came into 2020, I just started to really feel some things being stirred in my heart. And the Lord gave me some dreams uh, back in 2019. And I, as I've kind of been meditating and just looking back, I feel they're very key going into 2020. I'm not going to necessarily share the dreams as much as just refer to what I believe God is saying. And you know, 2020 in the secular media and all around the world, everyone's talking about 2020 vision, sin clearly having fresh vision, having fresh revelation. And I believe that's actually prophetic in many ways because God is wanting to release a fresh revelation of himself to the church in this season of 2020. It's not just you getting a vision for your life, even though that's important. It's actually you having a fresh vision of him. When you see him, everything changes. Until we stand in a place where we have met God, we don't have the authority to change a nation. Elijah was able to stand in two realms. When he confronted uh, the king Ahab, he says, before the Lord God of Israel, whom I stand. He was physically standing before King Ahab, but he was declaring that he was actually also standing in heaven before God. That was current tense. You know, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. It's not having heard. Hear, present tense hearing. Abraham would have killed Isaac if he did not carry on hearing God. Because God said, kill him, and then God said, stop. <laughs> so if all Abraham going was to kill him, then Isaac will be dead, right? <laughs> but because he was hearing. So the fact that God said something in a previous season does not mean that's what he's saying in this season. The right word in the wrong season can be disastrous. So you better make sure your hearing is current. And don't get distracted by all the things in the secular media. Just listening to that as your source of information as to what's going on on the earth. God has an opinion on Brexit. God has an opinion on Parliament. God, ha God has an opinion on Boris Johnson. Hello? Oh, you think God doesn't think about politics? <laughs> God is concerned about the decisions that are being made in this nation because the United Kingdom, in terms of God's intent and purpose, is an apostolic nation. I don't know if you realize that. This nation is called and was called. That's why the English language dominated the whole world. It's a sign of the anointing that God had on this land. It was perverted in certain ways, but actually God put it on this land for the sake of the gospel. And it was perverted, but God wants to redeem it. Because this nation is not meant to be a goat nation. It's meant to be a sheep nation. That's actually aligned with God's agenda in the end times. And listen to this. The United Kingdom is going to play strategic roles in the end time move of God in the earth. So don't you tell me God is not concerned about what's going on in our government. He has an opinion, and we can all afford to just listen to the media. And yes, it's good to know what's going on by listening to the media, but that can not only be our source of information. Because listen, there are headlines about the United Kingdom from heaven's perspective. Have you bothered to check into them today? Or is all you've listened to BBC News and Sky News? Because that is just listening from this dimension. How about from heaven's dimension? Because I'm telling you, it's a very different picture. And so oftentimes in the church, we're praying, Lord, let your kingdom come, let your will be done. And you realize that people are saying, let your will be done, but they really don't mean it. Because while they're saying, Lord, let your will be done, they know what their will is, and they're actually secretly believing that their will is God's will. But when they say, Lord, let your will be done, and he brings his will, and it's different to their will, then they start to post on Twitter and Facebook and start to complain. So that means they actually were not praying in honesty, sincerity, and authenticity. They're, see, this is then when you pray, it's not just your mouth that's speaking. Your heart is speaking as well. So words are coming from your heart and words are coming from your heart. And God is not just listening to the words from your mouth. He's listening to the words from your heart. And for many people, many times, there is a discordant sound coming from them. Because what is coming out here is different to what's coming out here. And God is like, no, 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 no. You're not being true. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. So there has to be a combination and a unity in what's coming out here and what's really in here. That's where prayer starts to gain authority because there is a real sense of authenticity. What's the point praying prayers that you don't really mean? If your words, if the prayers are not moving you, why should it move heaven? 
if you're not that bothered, why should heaven be bothered? So heaven is looking deeper, and heaven wants us to actually engage with its agenda. How do you know God's headlines in the earth right now? One of the ways is, obviously, your personal hearing. I'm going to go into that in a few moments. But another way is listening to what the prophetic voices in the nations, the, the voices that God has anointed and raised up, that, are proven, that have a proven track record, listen to what they're speaking and what they're saying heaven is saying right now. Are you hearing me? So God speaks through his prophets. I believe God has prophets on the earth right now that are communicating his heart. But many Christians are more bothered listening to BBC and Sky News than listening to what the Lord is saying. And when I say the prophets, and you know, oftentimes people just want to get a personal prophetic word. And that's not really what it's about. All through scripture, read, read through, you don't see lots of personal prophetic words. Now, nothing wrong with that. It was mostly words that dealt with nations and regions. Because God is seeing a bigger picture. So as we step into 2020, I believe God is calling us to 2020 vision and is calling us to transition from a place of just being individualistic and looking at our own self to actually having a vision of the kingdom. This is the way I'm putting it. We're transitioning from just the church age to the kingdom age. It means we're having a bigger picture of what God is doing and how we fit into God's agenda. You have to contend to have clarity on what God's doing in your region. Saying, Lord, how do I fit in? Not just coming up with a good idea and asking God to bless it. How about you find out what God is doing and just jump in the middle of it? Saying, God, what are you doing? I want to connect with that. And you see, when you're building and uh, you want to buy a house and you buy a land and you're going to build on the land and you're going to buy a property and build a church building, and that happens of, oftentimes uh, around the world, let's talk about the United Kingdom, you have to first obtain planning permission from the local government or whoever is in charge. So you submit your plans to them and then they have to approve before you can start planning and, and before you can start building, right? So you see that there is a system and a principle in place in that you cannot build what you want to build without first coming in line with those who have an overall vision, an overall, uh, 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 yeah, an overall heart to, they have certain agendas for a region and you cannot just build where you want, how you want without consulting their opinion on your building. Are, are you hearing what I'm saying right now? So to build effectively, you have to fit into their plan for the region. When God looks at Bristol, he has a purpose. And God's purpose for Bristol is actually the, in the body of Christ. Okay? He's going to use the body of Christ. And the body of Christ has his primary force through which he's going to change this region. So when God looks at a Bristol, he doesn't just see a local congregation. He sees... A body of believers. So as people in Bristol, you have to see beyond just your local congregation. You have to see that you're part of a wider body. Because if you don't have that vision, you're not thinking kingdom mindset. So for example, you go out on the streets and you reach out, you speak the word, you preach the word, and 20 people get saved. But all those 20 people, not one of them came to your church. Most people will end up depressed and, and uh, upset. In fact, many people are evangelizing just so that the people can come into their own church. What happens if you go out there and people encounter God and not one of them come to your church? See, your church may not have grown numerically, but the kingdom has advanced. So are you more concerned about just your numbers as opposed to God's greater purpose? Because God's greater purpose may mean you may not look like you're being successful in quotes. But are you more concerned about looking successful in the eyes of man as opposed to being successful in the eyes of heaven? Because remember, Jesus was on the cross dying. The crowds had gone. Everyone had gone. In fact, people look to him and says, you're a failure. Isn't it funny that the moment that people thought was his moment of greatest failure was actually his moment of greatest success? So success does not always look the way we think it has to look. We have to have heaven's perspective. Now, I'm not trying to say God is not concerned about numbers because for God so loved the whole world, that's billions of people. So God is concerned about numbers. However, those external things cannot be what defines our identity. Our identity has to be intimacy with God and closeness with him. And that's where our assignment comes from. And we want to be faithful in the assignment, whether it ends up being big or whether it ends up being small. Because some people's assignments may not be big in terms of thousands and millions. Are you with me? Not everyone is called to stand on the platform. And if God is not giving you this microphone, don't grab it. Because the microphone that you, I'm holding, this position comes with its own problems. 
Someone say, oh, I want a double anointing. Oh, pastor, lay hands on me, lay legs on me, and release a double anointing. Listen, if you want a double anointing, you also want a double trouble that brought the anointing. Are, are you hearing me? Oh, you just want, see, people, people, people like the effect of the anointing, but they don't realize a lot of the things that go on because of the anointing or the things that produce the anointing. You can't just be after the manifestation. You also have to be after the journey that leads to the manifestation. And that journey is not pretty. Speak to people God is using right now. The process is not easy. It's always difficult and hard because that's how God makes his warriors. The Lord wants to raise up warriors, not wimps. Too many in the church are wimps complaining about every little problem and not realizing they're called to overcome the situation. The church is meant to be a barracks where warriors are being bred, not a nursery where babies are being fed. Babies, babies want bottle, not battle. So all they care about is me, me, me. I've got a baby right now. All she knows is her. Cry, 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 cry. That's all they know. So I mean, oh, it's just me, just me. Well, if that's all you're doing, it's a sign of your maturity that all you're thinking about is yourself. And it's a sign that you need to grow up. Someone say grow up. Because when you grow up, you stop saying things like, I'm not being fed. What, what, what do you mean you're not being fed? Have you lost your Bible? <laughs> What do you mean you're not being fed? Have you lost your prayer life? I've got a six-year-old and he can feed himself. So when you grow in God, you don't need a pastor to come and feed you. You don't go to a subway or your restaurant and order food and expect the waiter to come and put the food in your mouth. You feed yourself. What do you mean not being fed? Get in the word. What do you mean not being fed? Get into fasting. Get into prayer. And count to God for yourself. Because God is shifting things from just the platform to the people now. It's the day of the saints. It's not about megastar preachers and man of power for the hour or woman of power for the hour. God wants to raise up a powerful body of Christ, not just a powerful man of Christ. We are the body. We're meant to walk in that power. So just like I need to pray to come on this platform to minister, you need to have a prayer life before you go into your workplace to do your work. Whether that work is serving burgers or that work is driving a bus or that work is, or that work is preaching in front of millions. We all have the same kind of responsibility to seek God to be agents of transformation. So you need to take up that responsibility in 2020 because God wants to bring revelation into your assignment that connects with his bigger agenda. Clarity. And as God brings that clarity, he's also going to bring exposure. One of the dreams I had, the Lord was exposing some bad things that were going on in the church in the United Kingdom. And in this particular dream, I was at a massive conference and a leader uh, I was, uh, it wasn't there, but I was in the green room and the police came in, the police came in and then the leader came in and the moment the leader came in, I could see he realized it was over for him and the police arrested him. And I remember in the dream, I was just saying to him, this exposure was necessary for what God is doing. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. God had to, because the church can, I didn't say this in dream, but this is my interpretation. The church cannot carry on living lies. Our mouth is saying one thing. Our heart is saying, our life is, there's so, such a deception. And so we're just having on a facade. But the spirit realm, the demons are laughing at us. The angels are very sad looking at us because they can see that we're not the real deal. We say one thing in church and we do another thing during the week. No wonder we're not having the influence in the spirit realm and changing the nation like we're supposed to. So I believe God is going to begin to bring exposure over the church in the United Kingdom. He's going to begin to shine his light. Some leaders are going to begin to be exposed in things that they're doing that they need to repent of and they need to align with God in. I believe that's going to begin to happen more in 2020. Are you hearing me today? Also in 2020, I believe the Lord wants us to take charge of the gateways. And when I say that, I'm going to read this scripture. In Genesis twenty-two seventeen, 17, uh, this is a story that talks about Abraham. And uh, I'll just read the passage and then I'll give you a backstory to it. Bless, blessing, I will bless you. This is what the Lord says to Abraham. Blessing, I will bless you. And multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gates of their enemies. Genesis twenty-two seventeen, 17. And... Uh, the Lord 
spoke this word to Abraham at a critical moment in his life. Abraham, before this moment, had already been, he had the ability to hear God. And he knew God was speaking to him. And he knew how to respond to that. So this isn't the first time he'd heard God. But this was a significant time because of the weightiness of the promise that God was speaking over his life. But you have to have a backstory. This is, again, what I was saying earlier on. When you see people that God's using in certain ways, don't just be like, oh, yeah, God, I want that. I like to know the backstory. I like to know how is it that God's using them that way? What is their prayer life like? What is their fasting life like? What's the journey? How many years were they in the desert? Are you hearing me? So I like to know people's journey and story. So here is Abraham. You're looking at the blessing, but you have to understand the depth of affliction he went through in the process. Because he went through years of believing God for a child. And then when God gave him the child he was believing for, God now said, kill him. Okay, those of you who are parents here, you probably can relate to how almost impossible it is to comprehend God saying this to a person. You've prayed so long for a child, you have the child, and God said, kill him. Abraham did not have a Bible. And Abraham, after he received the the word, did not say, Lord, give me five confirmations. I want to see an angel appear before me. I want to see, you know, it rain tomorrow. And then I want to see BBC News speak it out right on the, I want the the person on the news say, hey, Abraham, God is saying to you, kill, until Lord, I get these five confirmations. I'm not going to, because that's a radical thing for anyone to hear from God. But Abraham did not even doubt. He just picked up his son and went. That tells us how much he was confident of the voice of God in his life. For many of us, God speaks and we're like, is that God? Is that me? Is that the devil? Oh God, what's going on? (laughs) God spoke. Abraham knew God is speaking. See, God wants to sharpen your ears, 2020. To hear him more clearly. The reason why you're struggling to hear God is because the noise in your soul is very loud. You don't believe me? Lock yourself in a room and say, Lord, I'm going to be quiet before you for the next hour. And then you find out how noisy your soul is. It's not like God is not speaking. He's speaking, but you're not often able to tune in your ear to him because there's too many distractions, too many distractions. And when you begin to tune out the distractions, it's difficult on your flesh. That's why you're finding prayer boring. Prayer is not boring because God is boring. Prayer is boring because you're boring. (laughs) God cannot be boring. Look at the universe. Look at you. Look at the complications in the eye, the ear, the organs. How can the God who did all that be boring? He is, in fact, read the book of Revelations. All these weird beings with eyes inside out. You see, God is not boring. You are, so next time you're struggling to pray, just remember me. You are boring. (laughs) You're not struggling to pray because God does not want to reveal himself to you. I struggle with the same thing you struggle with. And I know it's not God's fault. It's the, it's the problem of the flesh. You're encountering the flesh realm, which is where most of us live in. Our soulish realm is in our flesh realm. And that's what we're more conscious of. But you're not just a physical being sitting right there. Your body is not you. Your body is your earthly suit that makes you legal on this planet. Without your body, you are an illegal spirit on this planet. (laughs) Your body makes you legal. So when you die, when your body dies, you still exist. Every human being lives forever. It's just a matter of where you live. Because there's heaven and there's hell. You have to choose. And you choose while you're in the body where you're going to go. God doesn't send people to hell. It's a choice that they make to reject him. So by default, they cannot access his realm because they have not accepted the gift of salvation. He is not sending people there. It's choices that send people there. So every human being lives forever. It's just a matter of whether you're going to live in heaven or live in hell. And you make the decision right now. So God is wanting you as his people to be a, a, a body of believers as we step into 2020 that are having 2020 vision, are able to discern clearly what God is saying. And like Abraham, God is wanting us to have ears that are able to discern him clearly and obey as soon as he speaks. So Abraham hears the word of the Lord. He gets his son and starts to walk with his son to go and sacrifice his son. Now, if I was God... Knowing that I have my own son, the fact that Abraham got out of bed 
and actually started to move towards doing what God asked him to do, I would have said to Abraham, okay, Abraham, I know you, you actually obey me now. So, Abraham, it's okay. You can go back home. God didn't stop Abraham when he got out of bed. God didn't stop Abraham when he got to the foot of the mountain. God didn't stop Abraham when he built the altar. Abraham laid his son on the altar. God didn't stop him. It's only when Abraham raised the knife that God says, stop. Why is it that God didn't stop him when he started the journey? Because that was several hours. Abraham was in the process of obeying God. But like any sane parent, there is no way God can ask you to do something like that and there will be no struggle in your heart. Now, the Bible doesn't say Abraham was struggling, but I guarantee you, Abraham was feeling something. And the process of the journey had to get him to think about how he was feeling if he was still going to carry it out. So actually, Abraham was not quite ready to kill Isaac until that knife was raised. When that knife was raised, you know what happened? Isaac died in that moment in Abraham's heart. Because Isaac died in Abraham's heart, God pretty much resurrected Isaac in the natural back to Abraham. Many of you, your Isaacs need to die in your heart. You know what that means? I know what it's like. You're contending for certain things. You want to see certain breakthroughs. The prayer request and those things you want to see God do can actually become an idol. Oh, God, I want this ministry to grow. Yes, God wants the ministry to grow. But God knows that when the ministry grows, you're going to actually be distracted from him. So God knows that in your praying for the ministry to grow, you actually, ha you actually have an idol of just looking good and looking successful in the eyes of man and having a big church because you want to prove to your pastor down the road that you are actually anointed. So you're praying, Lord, give me, and he wants to give that church. But the, 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 the motive, something deeper behind the prayer, God is wanting to deal with. So first, you have to die to the prayer request. Hello, Hannah. Hannah says, God, I want a child. I want a, God, give me a child. And do you know God only gave Hannah the child when she died to it? How do I know? When she said, God, okay, if you give me a child, I will give him back to you. Okay, we think that means she takes him to, she takes him to the church and the pastor dedicates Samuel and that's it. No, no, no. It's not a dedication service where she then takes Samuel back to her house. She's saying, Lord, this is my child. After I've weaned him, I'm going to leave him never to see him again apart from every now and again in a year. Do you understand how intense that is? How many parents are in the room? I've just had a baby. I cannot understand saying, Lord, I'm going to leave this baby over there and only see him twice a year. Or, I, do you understand the depth of that commitment? To get to that place in a prayer, she died to the very thing she wanted. And then God says, now I'm giving it back to you. Death is the pathway to resurrection. There will be no resurrection without crucifixion. You want to see God move in your life? Die. You want to see the power of God come in a fresh way? Die. Die to your ambitions. Die to self. Die to all the ideas that you've got from all the popular things you think are the right ways to build ministry or build business. Nothing wrong with principles, but you want God's ideals. You want God's agenda. And sometimes you have to die to yours. And no one wants to die. Dying is not fun. That's why you're not all jumping around, running around the room right now when I say die. <laughs> because it's not fun. But actually, it's incredible yes. what comes out of the process of death. So Abraham went through this process, and then God released the greatest promise. And that promise is that his descendants would be like the, uh, like the sands on the seashore. And then God ended it with this. They will possess the gate of the enemy. Everyone say, possess the gate of the enemy. Now, we know we're connected to that promise because of Galatians, Galatians 3.29. If you're Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So theologically, we are the seed of Abraham in the new covenant. We are connected to that promise. So guess what, church? We are called to possess the gate of the enemy. Now, let's come back to 2020. 2020 talks about 2020 vision. However, in the Hebraic calendar the hebrew calendar 
it's not the year 2020, it's the year 5780. And I do like paying attention to the Hebrew calendar because I believe it's prophetic. In terms of often understanding what God's doing on the earth, I think it's important we understand what's happening with Israel, the nation Israel. Because let me say this, God is not finished with the people, the Jewish people. Now, I do believe salvation is all through Jesus. There's no other way to heaven but by God. I do agree with that. However, I'm going to say God is not finished with, the, are, are you hearing me? So I honor what God's doing on the earth, especially the Jewish people. And what's happening in the Middle East, if you want to have a prophetic insight to what's happening in the earth, I believe there needs to be an understanding of what's going on with the Jewish people. I feel there's a real connection there. So I'm saying all that to say the year 5780 is the Jewish year we've just stepped into. That actually started in September. Now, this Jewish year, the 8-0 is the start of a new decade, and that 8 and 0, that, that number 8 really speaks of uh, an alphabet in the Jewish uh, alphabet system that refers to sound mouth and declaration. Are you tracking with me? So we have 2020 vision. The Hebraic calendar, that's the Gregorian calendar talking about vision. The Hebraic calendar is talking about declaration, mouth, Okay, in between vision and declaration is one thing, the ears. So I want to talk about the gates, and then we're going to finish. You have the eye gate, you have the ear gate, and then you have the mouth gate. According to the prophetic picture from the Hebrew calendar, we're stepping into a decade of declaration and decrees. By the Gregorian calendar, we're stepping into a decade of or a year of seeing and 2020 vision. However, I believe the enemy is actually after your mouth. Because words are powerful. Words have prophetic implication and have no geographic limitation. So you can be right here and the words you're speaking actually impact something in London and impact something in South Africa. Because the distance in the natural is not the same in the spirit realm as we think of it. So... There's an emphasis on decrees and declaration. However, to take control of our mouth, the enemy actually gains access to our hearts. And the inroads to our heart at the gateways of the eyes and the ears. And I believe as we're stepping into 2020, God is wanting us to dispossess the influence of the enemy from our gateways. So that when we decree a word, there's authority in it. Because you're not able to possess the gate of the enemy as long as he has possessed your gate. Gateway speaks of a place of authority, influence, a place of government. Whoever sits at the gate has governmental authority and influence over a region. So it's important we're actually possessing the gate of the enemy. But we cannot have that influence in our prayer, in our fasting, if our eye gates are possessed by filth. Our ear gates are possessed by filth. Now, all this, the eye gate people says by filth and pornography and all that, this one dimension. There are other dimensions of things we entertain that are not of God. It doesn't always have to be immorality. Even the ear gate. Some of you are not necessarily listening to junk in terms of, you know, junk music or junk declarations and junk conversations. You may be actually listening to whispers, demonic whispers that you have now accepted because those thoughts came to you as your thoughts. So you thought it was your thoughts, but it was actually demonic thoughts that you accepted and now your ear gate has been possessed by the enemy and because of that your heart is now influenced by his agenda and because of that your life is now being hijacked by him because now your mouth is speaking what's coming from your heart because the enemy actually conceives lies in your heart and uses your mouth to birth them so you have to be careful what you're allowing in just check this out this is amazing to me um in the year 2001, we had the uh, terrorist attack, 9-11. And the world was changed forever after 9-11 because of the magnitude of the attack in terms of in America, the most powerful nation on earth, and the way it was all done. It was really incredible. The strategy, the planning, the way they were able to carry all that out. 2,996 people died. Now, in the year 2000, it is recorded that there were 26 plane hijackings. I don't know how many happened in 2001, but we know definitely the Twin Towers and all the 9-11, uh, all that happened. Now, in the year 2002, there were recorded 10 plane hijackings. So, in the year 2000, before 9-11, there were 26. 2003, uh, uh, 2002, there was 10. 2004, there was recorded four. 
Do you see the trend? The decreasing of the number. In 2005, there was only one recorded plane hijacking. Okay, 2011, 2019, 2017. Did you hear of any plane being hijacked? I didn't. Now, do you know why no planes are being hijacked right now like they used to? Because of the increased security system at the gate. So the terrorists that used to be able to take on weapons to the planes are not able to get on the plane with those weapons anymore because the security system all across the planet at airports is on a whole new level. So the, the, the terrorists cannot get onto the plane to hijack the destiny of the plane because of increased security. Now, do you know why your life is heading in a direction that you don't want it to, but somehow don't seem to be able to stop the direction it's heading in? Could it be that the security system at your gates are so low that the enemy has been getting in so easily? He's influenced your heart through your eye gate, your ear gate, and guess what's happening right now? He's hijacking the plane of your life. So you're making declarations. 2020 is going to be my best year yet. 20, but your gates have been possessed. So your words in the authority they're meant to carry are neutralized. And as we're stepping into 2020, I believe God is calling the people of God to dispossess the enemy from his influence at their gates so that they can arise and possess the territories that he's called them to possess. Are you hearing me today? So in essence... God is calling us to a whole new level of holiness. The message of holiness may not draw a crowd, but it will ultimately build the end time army of God. You see, spiritual warfare is not always about coming against demons. When you're walking right before God and you're living right, your life becomes a rebuke to the devil. Sometimes when demons manifested, when Jesus walked in the room, they cried out, Holy One of God. His holiness agitated them to manifest. You may walk into the shop one day, and maybe you're just doing your thing, and the people around you that are meant to actually treat you nice are being very horrible to you. Don't just cry out racism. <laughs> Could it be? That the presence you're carrying is agitating their demons. And you are just thinking in the natural, not seeing what's actually going on in the realm of the spirit. So you've got to be aware that there's a lot more going on than your eyes can see. And God wants you to begin a function from that realm of his vision from heaven down, not from earth up, from heaven down. We're seated in that realm. So we have to begin to see... And so when we begin to sit in that realm, we have to live holy because he's holy. He's called Holy Spirit for a reason. And if we're going to live holy, our gateways need to be possessed by him. And when our gateways are possessed by him, our heart is in a place of purity. And what does the Bible say? The pure in heart will. So the purity of the heart opens up realms of vision. So you want to have a fresh vision in 2020? Maybe you need to start with purity of heart. By dispossessing the enemy from your gateways. Saying, Lord, I have been listening to too much junk. I've been listening to too much distraction. I've been entertaining gossip. I've been entertaining wrong ideas and conversations for far too long. Lord, help me to see the security system and my gateways go to a whole new level. Father, if I step into an environment where things are going on that I should not entertain, let there be an alarm system by the Holy Spirit that wakes me up to not entertain any of those things in my life. Are you hearing me today?